After the war, America experienced an extraordinary economic boom. Our metropolitan areas were subjected to enormous growth pressures. And much of what was built was built badly and needed to be raised and reconfigured. Which war was this? Anybody, anyone want to guess? That's right. World War II, that's right too. <laughs> and Vietnam as well. Although it took about a decade after Vietnam for us to enter back into economic boom times. But in fact, post-World War I construction was the only time that we've had a post-war boom that resulted in good quality planning and good quality construction. We're now faced with the biggest peacetime boom in history and its aftermath, an incredibly degraded environment of strip malls uh, and shopping centers that are, many of them almost dead, that are ready to be uh, converted into some higher and better use, and subdivisions made of cheaply built houses that are disconnected from everything else in the world uh, except by, by automobile. Uh, Post-World post -World War I construction was generally quite good and the quality of the planning in the 1920s was extraordinary. It was probably the momentum of the progressive movement and the City Beautiful movement. Uh, the latter grew out of the 1893 World's Fair. Uh, a great white classical city of grand boulevards and civic splendor, which inspired the Burnham Plan, also inspired the American Academy in Rome, I'm happy to say. Uh, the Burnham Plan was a plan to remake Chicago, uh, and it had scores of imitators that were almost as ambitious in cities like St. Louis, San Francisco, Detroit, etc., etc. To remake these cities from the jerry-built post-war slums they had become into monuments to America's economic might and imperial ambitions at the time. The Burnham Plan even included the Wacker Manual, a curriculum for teaching middle, middle school students about the plan, a recognition that civic design is integral, is an integral part of civics. The City Beautiful movement, though related in many ways to the progressive movement, which attempted to separate tenements from steel mills and slaughterhouses, was nevertheless a lot more successful in building splendor into the public realm than it was in addressing the private comfort of the average citizen. By 1939, the Depression was in its tenth year. And if the living conditions of the average citizen weren't so hot in 1929, they were a lot worse by 1939, where people were doubling up in buildings that had had little maintenance in the past decade. Life wasn't so great for the average man, and General Motors knew it. So it hired Norman Bel Geddes to design its exhibit for the New York World's Fair, called Futurama. The Bel Geddes came up with a kinetic diorama showing people moving smoothly from city to countryside in the comfort of private automobiles and living in individual houses outside the city. After World War II, this vision of the American dream, which by the way was visited by 25% of the American populace <coughs> during the 39 World's Fair, this vision was pursued with even more vigor than the City Beautiful movement had mustered from the 1890s to the, through the 20s. What was good for General Motors was good for the country, in the immortal words of GM's chairman and America's Secretary of Defense, Charlie Wilson. And so we built up the National Defense Highway System, our interstates, making the world safe for suburban sprawl. The dream succeeded beyond General Motors' wildest hopes. American families not only had houses in the suburbs, 
they had two and three cars. Every trip, for school, for work, for shopping, even to go get exercise, required a car. The cost of GM's dream is absurdly high. Over 40,000 lives lost each year, more than we lost in Vietnam in traffic accidents. A, disproportion of them, a disproportionate number of them young lives. Kids kill each other at an astounding rate in automobiles. Much, it's much safer, by the way, to grow up in Harlem than to grow up in, uh, in a place like Scarsdale or suburban Pensacola. The mortality rate is much higher amongst suburban teenagers than amongst inner city teenagers because of traffic accidents. We also have an extremely expensive and risky military presence in the Persian Gulf because of our dependence on Persian Gulf oil. But the less quantifiable costs to our community and to public life are equally high. The office park, the subdivision, the highway, the strip, the mall, these are the places we've built for the past five decades. They are alienating and isolating places. Unlike the neighborhoods, the neighborhood schools kids could walk to, the soda fountains and cafes, the downtown offices and stores and restaurants which adults could walk to. Now our kids spend a quarter of their day in school buses or being chauffeured to activities, and we must drive to work, to lunch, and to the gym, even. Our choices in the suburban world are predominantly of the interchangeable, anonymous kind. The Kentucky Fried Chickens and McDonald's and Wendy's and Applebee's. Applebee's perhaps the most uh, egregious affront to our intelligence. The neighborhood bar and grill built miles from any neighborhood <laughs> along a strip. In our infatuation with this auto-dependent planning, we even developed campuses. Can I get my first slide, please? We even developed campuses where one must drive from one class to the next. Uh, this is actually a, an office campus uh, that was state-of-the-art in 1970, as was UWF's campus. Uh, I'll leave it up there so that you'll feel better. This is a lot worse than UWF's campus. Uh, but I won't let you off easy. It's a terrible campus. It's a place where the chance encounter and informal interchange, which is the most important part of college life, as I recall, for students and for faculty, is made as difficult as possible. Where a meeting that happened, I believe last night, according to uh, my Brian Spencer, who toured me around town this morning, required that everybody get in their cars and go off campus to actually have a drink and rub elbows and, and uh, talk about what happened. The best campus is, next slide please. The best campuses in this country predate both the New York World's Fair and the Chicago, both the city beautiful grand civic planning traditions and the suburban dream. This is actually MIT, which is not, in my opinion, one of the better campus plans. Uh, MIT is typical of the City Beautiful Beaux-Arts planning uh, practice, where you get a rational campus where everything is integrated. Uh, you have underground passageways. You never need to leave the campus, uh, except if you want to get uh, a good cup of coffee, or go to a good bookstore, hang out, or go to a good restaurant. In which case, not only can't you walk across the street, because it's a slum over there, you've got to go down to the next place. Next slide, please. There's Harvard Yard. This was not a Beaux-Arts plan. Th this is something that grew like Topsy. It was a series of tiny farms that became campuses. and Harvard Yard, uh, which I remember with some fondness, is tiny. It's probably 50 acres. Uh, it's connected to Harvard Square right across the street by walking through a thick wall composed of dormitories. 
And when you get across the street, you're in one of the most vibrant urban environments uh, on the planet, a place where you can have a choice of 20 places to get a good cup of coffee, six or eight great bookstores, wonderful cinemas, uh, and you can also live. You, there are lots of places for students and faculty to live so that they can walk to classes. Uh, next slide, please. We also have places like Hanover, New Hampshire. Next. Uh, trying to s remember what that one is. Keep going. Uh, I, there's another one of Hanover from the air. You can see how tiny this thing is. Uh, keep going. And Annapolis, uh, uh, Annapolis. These are places that closely integrate vibrant urban life, city or small town urban life, with campus life. The campuses are small quads, 40 to 60 acres, surrounded by urban fabric, surrounded by housing for students and faculty and other townspeople, by shops, restaurants, cinemas, bookstores, places to hear music, to see theater, to listen to poetry, or just to hang out. Uh, these are also the best places for raising children. I'm leaving Annapolis up here because Pensacola could be such a place. Annapolis is the only campus we've seen that has this kind of waterfront. Pensacola has much better waterfront. It's warmer here. These are also the best places for active retirement. In all the surveys that the American Association of Retired Persons uh, do that ask our generation where they want to retire, it's not the century cities or the leisure villages of this world where you're put into a concentration camp for old people. It's college towns. It's places that have this combination of intellectual life and urbanity uh, and hopefully small town civility. If they also have attractive weather and water, they're even more attractive. More, they will bring baby boomers in even greater numbers. Pensacola could be such a place. The University of West Florida could play a very important part. It's already beginning to do that. It already has a strategy uh, of buying up older buildings here. And it's a strategy that's been proved by the Savannah College of Art and Design, which bought up older buildings for the past 20 years throughout Savannah. The city's own fabric of pedestrian scaled streets alternating with beautiful squares is the campus. There is no campus plan. They've been completely opportunistic, as has UWF in buying up old buildings. I would encourage you to step up your program of doing this, uh, perhaps consider even abandoning the suburban campus up north, uh, or certainly reconfiguring it. This place could be as beautiful as Annapolis, as beautiful as Harvard Yard and Harvard Square, and have the added advantage of warm weather and water. Um, the investments UWF is making in Pensacola will have a profound effect on Pensacola and make it a much more interesting and desirable town. It will also make UWF a much more attractive place for recruiting the best faculty and students. When people think about where they want to go to college, if you could get a 17-year-old to draw a picture of a college, he'd draw a picture of Hanover, New Hampshire as a college town, or Amherst, or Swarthmore, or a place like that. He would not draw a picture of UWF's campus. But he might very well draw a picture of a few quads scattered strategically around downtown uh, Pensacola. The city itself must do its part. Uh, the sewage treatment plant clearly needs to be moved to a less valuable piece of property. That's million dollar an acre land that that thing's sitting on, and it's polluting your bay. It's <coughs> astounding that, that the city fathers have left it there as long as they have. It's, it's an affront to the neighborhood that it got plopped down in, and it's now far past time to move that to a more appropriate location to improve its performance and to reuse that land for a much higher and much better use, a mixed income and mixed use neighborhood. Uh, there are 
wonderful HUD programs that have cropped up uh, in, in uh, I'm happy to say, as a result uh, largely of efforts made by the Congress for the New Urbanism, which I chaired until a few months ago, uh, to convert HUD's in efforts from building low-income housing projects to building mixed income, mixed use neighborhoods. They've torn down some of the worst projects around and replaced them with completely viable neighborhoods uh, and provided places for less affluent people to live alongside with more affluent people. And they seem to work just fine uh, as neighborhoods, as places revive civic life as we used to know it. The city hall itself uh, is an astoundingly ugly building, especially compared with the old city hall. Uh, but it could be screened. It's, there's a huge parking lot sitting in front of it. And that parking lot should have mixed-use buildings uh, lined with shops on the ground floor and apartments above and wrapping parking decks. Again, that land's too valuable to have that much surface parking. If you think of this as a special town, as a town really worth caring about. If you think this town is really worthless, then you have surface parking lots all over the place. Uh, the, uh, that street needs to become a boulevard. It needs to carry a fair amount of traffic. But there are streets in Paris that carry far more traffic than that, where people pay three or four bucks for a cup of coffee for the privilege of sitting at a sidewalk cafe along uh, a French boulevard. That thing could become a boulevard lined with three to five story buildings and become one of the nicest parts of Pensacola. And then of course the Trillium Tract, which the city just bought, really needs to become a mixed use, mixed income neighborhood with a wonderful esplanade park, a linear park along the, uh, along the bay. And, and that would add enormously to the city's uh, life, as well, of, uh, of course, as adding to the uh, tax revenues. But the main reason to do it is not just for tax revenues, it's to create urban life. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I guess this is one more campus uh, that I like to uh, show. Uh, <laughs> this is a campus. These are school buildings right here. Uh, We've talked off and on about uh, the university system uh, having an outpost here at some point. Uh, there's land set aside for the university if it wants to do that. Uh, and you can see how fully integrated this thing is into the town. It is not set aside and it's, it's tiny, but we have uh, right now 90 middle school students who get a much better education in this place as a result of living and learning, living in a town and learning from it than they do in the suburban campuses elsewhere in Walton County. Uh, next slide, please. The, this is a diagram that is equally applicable to city-sponsored uses and university-sponsored uses. This is a notion that public buildings or public life needs to be integrated into the city. Next slide. This is what happens when you break up public buildings, when you disabuse yourself of the notion that these so-called civic centers will actually add anything to civic life, and you take them and break them into the smallest possible component parts and scatter them around the city, and then you have a library and an assembly hall uh, and a church and a concert hall, each adding energy to its own neighborhood instead of uh, subtracting energy from a huge swath of land around it. Think of all the civic centers you know in America and think of the way they function as economic and social black holes. They, they create uh, enormous swaths of no man's land all around them because they're too damn big and they're too inward focused. And if the city does this kind of thing with the Trillium Tract, it will be not just a shame, it will be a crime. You ought to know better. 
the notion of doing of the city taking on this kind of role of uh, building s structured parking and wrapping it with retail and housing uh, is one that my new company, the Arcadia Land, is experiencing enormous success with in downtown Albuquerque. We're in a joint venture with the city where we're purchasing uh, six city blocks from them, uh, four city blocks from uh, private landowners. The city's responsibility in this venture is to provide all of the parking. They're, they floated a, a big bond issue and they're building parking structures on the inner uh, part of the donut of a block and we're wrapping those parking structures with mixed-use buildings. So you don't see uh, parking structures as your primary experience of the street or the public realm. You see buildings that are filled with life, with shops and cafes, a movie theater. Uh, the movie theater itself, by the way, is a black box which is being wrapped by restaurants with offices above. Uh, the city is also providing, for, with this uh, bond, uh, money to redo its streets. It has, like so many American cities, it, it was seduced by the blandishments of traffic planners and it converted a lot of streets to one-way streets, which uh, make it very unpleasant for people to walk around uh, a city. If you want to have a city with pedestrian life, you need to be prepared to convert these back to two-way streets. Uh, and then it's worked out a, what I think is a very functional relationship uh, with the city providing the infrastructure investments, uh, our company uh, working with a, a group called the Downtown Action Group, uh, providing the uh, master development skills and then enlisting uh, as many local contractors and developers as possible in building uh, the individual buildings. Uh, the other interesting thing is that there's a foundation, the McCune Foundation, the largest in New Mexico, which is investing a significant piece of its portfolio in the revitalization of downtown Albuquerque. And I was thrilled to hear Brian talk about a kind of informal version of this uh, investment in public good being done by Pensacola Capital. Uh, in both cases, we are looking at this as a good long-term investment with short-term returns that would probably not attract capital uh, in a climate in, in which uh, the expectations are that real estate ought to produce internal rates of return north of 20 percent because it's a high-risk crapshoot. That is true if you're building a Houston office building. It's not true if you're revitalizing a city and you have the support of a great university and of the city fathers. It's a very low-risk venture with huge long-term returns. Uh, but it probably still can't create pro formas that will satisfy Wall Street. So it requires people like the civic leadership of this city that Brian's working with, or people like the uh, folks of the McCune Foundation who are willing to park their money for five to ten years and hope or even know that it will have a good return in time. The challenge of transforming UWF's suburban sprawling campus is longer term, but not impossible. A set of small quads surrounded by college town neighborhoods could be realized uh, in a few decades if a clear and cogent vision of this could be created. The two seminal world's fairs showed us the power of a strong vision, a dream to be pursued. It's time for a new dream for this university and this community. I hope you'll see this, seize this opportunity. I hope I can be of help. Thank you.